Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Dave and Pam Show, also known as Best Practices for Deployment of SQL Server on Azure VMs. Before we get started, um, let's just do a little housekeeping here. So welcome to PASS, or I guess it's the last day of PASS, so I hope you've enjoyed your PASS and you've explored everything that PASS has to offer. If not, it's not too late to join us um, in the booth or in the clinic um, and to just explore everything that PASS has to offer. Um, also, please, your feedback is important to us. I'm not kidding. I'm very serious. We would really love for you to let us know, um, you know, if you liked the session or if there was something that was a miss for you and certainly give us some feedback on uh, what we can do better for you next time. Um, and just note that you need to submit these before Friday, November 20th to win wonderful prizes. And I'll hand it off to my colleague, David, for his intro. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is David Plus. I'm a senior program manager with Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for just a little over 14 years, covering SQL Server performance tuning and optimization, high availability, disaster recovery, reporting services, and I was an Azure technical trainer focusing on the stack um, and all of the technologies around SQL Server in the cloud. Thanks, David. And I am Pam Lahoud. I am also a program manager on the Azure Data SQL Enterprise team. Um, I've been with Microsoft almost the same amount of time as David. Um, will be 15 years in February. Um, and I've uh, done several other positions at Microsoft, such as a premier field engineer, premier support for developers. I focused on um, SQL Server performance tuning and optimization primarily. Um, and since joining the enterprise team, I've um, been focused on um, the storage engine, SQL OS, and now I'm the lead PM for SQL on Azure VM. So today, as implied in the title, we want to talk to you a little bit about running your SQL Server workloads in Azure on Azure Virtual Machines. Um, so being provided by Microsoft to produce a SQL Server, of course, we know how to run SQL Server. And so we're working to make the experience of running SQL Server in an Azure VM a world-class experience for SQL Server so that uh, Azure truly is the best place to run SQL Server in the cloud. So today we're going to do a little overview about SQL Virtual Machines. We'll talk how to about how to choose the right VM configuration. Um, some SQL Server configurations that you might want to consider when running in Azure VMs. And then we'll finish it up with some high availability and disaster recovery options in Azure. And then um, at the very end, we'll do some Q&A. So the thing that we really want to stress with SQL Server is that SQL Server is everywhere. So you're, you may be used to running SQL Server on-prem, but SQL Server, the engine, is available on uh, just about any platform you could choose to run it. So we also run SQL Server on Linux. And when we say best for a compatible SQL running on Linux, what we mean there is that the SQL Server engine running on Linux is the same as the one running on Windows. It's fully compatible with that SQL Server. You can take a backup from your on-prem SQL Server 2019 in Windows, and you can restore that on SQL Server on Linux and vice versa. The files, uh, the file structures are the same. Every, everything about the engine is the same. Um, there may be a few um, features that run outside of SQL Server that might not be available, but it truly is the SQL Server that you know and love, and it's fully compatible with all of your database features that you're already running um, on-prem. Then, of course, we have SQL in containers. A portable and an easy to spin up and patch a version of SQL Server. Great for um, spinning up development environments or making your workload portable so that you can run it anywhere. Anywhere where you can have a container, um, you can run the same SQL Server. Um, similarly, Kubernetes. Uh, so again, a container technology with orchestration and built-in high availability. And same thing, SQL Server, same engine. Um, and running on any Kubernetes you choose. Uh, SQL virtual machines. These are virtual machines running in Azure. Um, and so again, this is the same 
SQL Server product that you're running on-prem, but running in an Azure environment where you don't have to manage the infrastructure that that sits on. And this is uh, good for uh, lift and shift migrations, uh, particularly when you need access to the operating system level. Then of course you have managed instances, which is a, a, a PaaS or platform as a service solution, um, but it's closer to lift and shift than Azure SQL database because it provides uh, an instance level. So you can have multiple databases in the same instance, but still have a PaaS solution. So this is also good for lift and shift but in this case, you don't have access to the operating system. So if you need a little more control, you can opt for VM, or if you need uh, more manageability, you opt for MI. Um, and then SQL databases. So these would be your single databases or pool, elastic pools of databases. This also includes hyperscale and serverless options. So um, if your application is born in the cloud or it's a modern cloud, uh, application that's already been optimized for the cloud, then SQL database is the way to go. And then last but certainly not least, SQL Edge, which is our IoT offering for SQL Server. So if you want to run SQL Server on a Raspberry Pi that you carry around with you, you can do that with SQL Edge. So across this suite of SQL Server products, Remember that it is the same database engine no matter where you run it. So your applications should work nearly seamlessly across all of the platforms where SQL Server runs. And you can choose whichever one of these offerings best suits uh, your needs for your uh, SQL Server application. And of course, today we're going to go ahead and focus on SQL Virtual Machines. So when we talk about the cloud versions of SQL Server, we're essentially talking about Azure SQL, which is SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machines, Azure SQL Managed Instance, and Azure SQL Database. So the one that we're gonna talk about today, SQL on Virtual Machines, is infrastructure as a service. So in this case, Microsoft is managing the platform that the virtual machine runs on. So we take care of all of the hardware and we take care of the virtual machine infrastructure itself. And then you own everything from the operating system up. So this gives you a little bit more control. Like say you needed to run C uh, applications side by side with SQL Server in the same server. You could do that using um, SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machine. Uh, the trade-off here is that you have a little bit less manageability. So you have to um, do more of the things that you would do on-prem, such as um, configuring your own backups, uh, doing your own patching, things like that, that would be done for you in a PaaS service, um, you have uh, the responsibility to do those when you're running SQL Server on virtual machine. But what we're going to talk about today is some of the benefits you get from running that VM on Azure and how we can help you with, uh, with those uh, management tasks when you're running in, in Azure. One of the very cool things about uh, running SQL Server in Azure VM is some of the benefits that you get if you have software assurance. So um, the first thing we wanted to talk about is um, the high availability and disaster recovery benefits. So what you see here on this slide is um, first failover with primary in Azure VMs. So this is if you're running all in Azure VMs. So you uh, say you're running an availability group, for example, you have your primary instance in an Azure VM. So this would this instance would be fully uh, license. So in this case, you'd have six cores, you have six core licenses. Your software assurance benefits allow you to have one passive secondary for high availability, and then a second passive secondary for disaster recovery at no additional charge. So software assurance gives you two additional replicas, one for HA and one for DR, when your primary is in Azure. When you're running in a hybrid failover environment where your primary instance is on premises, same thing, you pay for that primary instance and then you get a passive secondary for HA and a passive secondary for DR. On top of that, you can get a second DR instance in Azure. So you're effectively getting three instances of SQL Server for free when you have software assurance, if you want to have that extra uh, protection of having a disaster recovery replica in the cloud. So this is a great option if you need to have like a second data center, but you don't wanna pay for a second data center, 
you can leverage Azure as your DR data center at no additional cost, provided that you are uh, that you have software assurance. So this is a great option um, if you want to leverage Azure for disaster recovery. Also, I know you're out there. There are many of you that are still running SQL Server 2008 and SQL Server 2008 R2, which is over a year outside of support. If you were to move your SQL Server uh, 2008 or 2008 R2 workloads into Azure um, and run them as virtual machines, then you get that extended security update agreement for free. So this is a way for you to buy yourself a little more time to migrate off of those older platforms. If you're not ready, if you have an application that maybe is gonna go out of commission in a year or so, or you're still in the process of standing up a replacement application, or simply that you're not ready to upgrade SQL Server, this is a way for you to get those uh, extended security updates and to remain in compliance um, while still running on SQL Server 2008. So that's another option for you with SQL Server and Azure Virtual Machines. So now I wanna walk into some of the things that are um, unique to the service itself to running SQL Server on an Azure Virtual Machine. And uh, many of the benefits that you can provide, uh, that you can um, leverage in Azure are provided through the SQL IaaS agent extension. So this is a free service that you can run in your Azure virtual machines that give you those value added services that you would normally get in a PaaS offering. So things like automated backups, automated patching, um, some configuration options directly through the portal. Um, those things that are nice about having cloud databases we can offer those to you even if you're running in a virtual machine if you install the SQL IaaS agent extension. So this also allows you to view all of your SQL servers that are deployed within your subscription in Azure. You'll get a new blade for SQL virtual machines that will, sh that will show you all of those VMs as well as um, all of your other Azure SQL instances like managed instance and SQL database. And if you're running one of our new Azure Arc servers, those will also be integrated. So basically you'll be able to see your entire SQL Server estate in Azure through a single pane of glass. And so not just, not just your virtual machines, but any sort of Azure SQL that you have deployed all in one view. Um, this also allows you to leverage another one of your um, software assurance benefits, which is Azure Hybrid Benefit. Azure Hybrid Benefit allows you to apply your on-prem licenses to the cloud um, if you have software assurance. Again, it's one of those benefits of software assurance. So what this allows you to do is um, set your license type within Azure to Azure Hybrid Benefit. And when you do that, you're not paying those uh, pay-as-you-go licensing costs, which tend to be more expensive, but you're leveraging your existing on-premises uh, investment in order to pay for your um, SQL Server licensing costs in the cloud. So this is a really great way to optimize your licensing costs in SQL Server. And you can only leverage that Azure hybrid benefit if you are um, using this IaaS agent extension. So this is important to register with this extension. So not only do you get to leverage the, the features, some of those automated PaaS-like features that you get in Azure, but you're able to maximize your uh, benefits of your software assurance by having the um, IaaS agent extension um, enabled in your virtual machine. And you need this to be able to do those uh, licensing conversions between uh, Pago and Azure Hybrid Benefit, as well as the disaster recovery and high availability options that we talked about in the previous slide. So how do you get this IaaS extension? Well, um, the IaaS extension is installed by default if you use an Azure Marketplace image. So if you go into the Marketplace and you choose a SQL Server image and deploy that through the Marketplace, you will automatically have the IaaS agent extension um, and you'll get all those benefits automatically. And in fact, there are some benefits that you get just through setup which are incredibly helpful. Things like storage configuration, automatic storage configuration that will help you, um, you know, make sure that your storage is configured correctly. Um, and also just some guidance on, um, you know, configuring SQL Server. 
Um, so if you use that marketplace image, you get all that by default. If you are using your own templates or if you're using something like Terraform or you're just self-installing SQL Server on an existing virtual machine, you can still get the IaaS agent extension. The easiest way to do that is to use our new automatic registration. So with automatic registration, there is a little um, button in the SQL Virtual Machine Blade that says Automatic SQL Server VM Registration. You can see a little screenshot of that. When you click that button, a EULA um, opens up and you basically just check a box to say, yes, I consent to Microsoft registering all my existing and future SQL Server and Azure VMs in the subscription. So when you do that, there is an automated job that runs every day and any new SQL servers that it detects within the subscription will be registered with the IaaS extension, and then they will get the benefit of having all those extra features um, as well as the software assurance benefits. Um, and so that works for once you check the box, any future VMs that are created, we will also detect those as well. So the benefits of this is it's just a single click and then it works for the whole subscription. You can also do this through scripting with the CLI if you prefer. Um, and it doesn't matter what versions of SQL Server that you're running, we will detect everything from 2008 plus. Um, the other thing that's important to note here is that um, this data cannot be used for auditing purposes unless you authorize us to do that. So if you want us to use this data to help you do a licensing true up, then we can do that. But we uh, have guaranteed, and we've actually modified our, our uh, privacy policy to guarantee to customers that we will not use this data for an audit without your consent. So we are, we are not going to use this data in order to check up on how many licenses you have. This is simply to provide you the value added services in Azure. Um, and then we will not use that data for any other purpose without your consent. So that's the new automatic registration available today in the Azure portal. If you prefer not to wait for that, you can also manually um, register with the resource provider or with the IaaS extension. Um, you first have to enable it in your subscription at the top. So this is using the, the CLI, Azure CLI command line utility. So you register the subscription itself with the SQL Virtual Machine. And then once that's done, then the VM that you want to register, you just run this AZ SQL VM create, and you um, that will install the IaaS extension on that virtual machine. You also have the ability to use this bulk registration script, which will register all the SQL Server VMs within either one subscription or a list of subscriptions. So that's why if you don't wanna do the automatic registration, that's one way that you can get all of your VMs registered. However, I do recommend going with the automatic registration as it's obviously the easiest method. And then the last thing I wanted to point out here with the IaaS extension is that there are actually two modes, uh, full mode and lightweight mode. Um, in order to get the IaaS extension in the full mode, you actually need to restart the SQL Server service. So when you register a VM in full mode, it will automatically restart the service. So that you would need to schedule a maintenance window in order to enable that if it's already a production virtual machine. So if you're not able to do that, then you can register in lightweight mode. Um, this doesn't provide all the functionality. It only provides things like, you know, the, the manageability within the SQL virtual machine pane and the licensing um, options, all of that is enabled but some of the other features like storage configuration are not enabled. But with lightweight version, you do not have to restart the SQL Server service. So no downtime required to, to register in lightweight. And so of course, the automatic registration will, um, will always be in lightweight mode because clearly we don't want to, um, to restart your, your SQL servers unless um, unless you are, uh, you know, within a maintenance window. So, so when you turn on the automatic registration, you'll get the lightweight version. And then later on, you can always upgrade to the full version whenever you're ready to restart your SQL service and when you can take a maintenance window. So that's a little bit about 
the IaaS extension, which is how you can um, get a lot of the value of Azure for your SQL servers running in virtual machines in Azure. And with that, I'm going to hand this back off to David to talk a little bit about choosing the right VM size and configuring your virtual machines in Azure. All right. Thank you, Pam. Choosing the right VM configuration. All right. Let's start with our Azure compute options. Azure offers virtual machine types and sizes that can address about any type of workload. They have test workloads, burstable workloads, long running, mission critical, production workloads, whether it be customer facing applications to the ones that run businesses like SAP. We offer VM series optimized for compute, memory, disk, or GPU intensive workloads for both computational and visualization scenarios. So the portfolio is always growing. For our purposes though, we're gonna be focusing on SQL Server and data warehouse workloads for 4, 8, 16, 32 and higher core counts. We're looking for strong memory to core ratios, solid throughput with the right mix of performance features. And for this reason, we are optimizing for certain VM offerings. And we're gonna start with the memory optimized. Memory optimized VM sizes offers high memory to CPU ratios that are strong for database servers, medium to large caches and in-memory analytics. Next, we have our general purpose. The general purpose VM sizes gives us a good balance of CPU to memory ratios. You'll see some solid memory to core machines in this class for small to medium databases. And in particular, we look at the DSV2 series. And an honorable mention is the storage optimized. This um, class of machines have a high storage throughput and I.O. for really strong data warehouse scenarios and very large transactional databases. The LSV2 series features high throughput, low latency, and directly mapped local NVMe storage. For these machines, there's a consistent 8 gigs of memory per CPU and 1.92 terabytes of NVMe SSD device storage per eight CPU groupings. So you have a really strong progression for the entire storage optimized series for both mem to core ratios and throughput. All right, so let's talk about um, optimizing SQL Server licensing with constrained CPUs. The constrained vCPU capable VM sizes are designed specifically for database workloads that require high throughput without a high core count. They reduce the cost of software licensing, in particular for SQL Server, while maintaining the same memory, storage, and I.O. bandwidth. The vCPU count can be constrained to a half or to a quarter of the original VM size. So these new VM sizes have a suffix that specifies the number of active vCPUs to make them easier for you to identify. So you can see here for the standard M M32-16, you know that the source machine is the M32MS, but the constrained core count is 16. So you're going to be licensing for these 16 cores. Now, some database workloads like SQL Server that requires high memory storage and IO bandwidth, but not a high core count, will really take advantage of these scenarios because they may have database workloads that are not very CPU intensive. The most important point here is that the constrained B core counts helps reduce SQL Server licensing costs, but, and this is important, it does not reduce the compute cost, which includes the OS. The compute cost remains the same as the original size of the VM. Okay, and that is something to take note of. Okay, so let's talk about our Azure disk storage options. We do not recommend using the standard HDD and standard um, solid state disks for SQL Server workloads. So I'm gonna go ahead and gray those out. 
So these disk options really should only be used for non-production scenarios and maybe for web servers and lightweight application servers. What we're going to recommend is a premium solid state disk and ultra disk options. So premium solid state disk. Okay, these disks have low latency disk support and they're perfect for IO intensive workloads. Premium SSDs are good for mission critical production workloads and can only be used with VMs that support premium storage scenarios. A majority of our customers are using these premium SSDs for SQL Server workloads already. And we recommend customers start with a P30 and either use storage spaces to increase the throughput and the size options or choose a larger disk such as a P80. Now, the other scenario is the Ultra Disk. And we're going to recommend these for really, really low latency scenarios. These disks can be dynamically adjusted um, for disk performance without having to restart the virtual machines. And they're perfect for data intensive workloads, such as like high end database uh, systems and heavy transaction workloads. But remember, the Ultra Disk can only be used as data disks. And there are some limitations. The only infrastructure redundancy option that you can use with UltraDisk is availability zones. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Azure virtual machines have IOPS and throughput performance limits based on the virtual machine type and size, and all disks will have their own IOPS and throughput limits. Performance can get capped when it requests more, the application that is, requests more IOPS or throughput than what's allotted for the virtual machines or the attached disks. When capped, applications may experience suboptimal performance through this increased latency. So let's take a look at an example. We have an application that's going to be making some requests to a D8 SV3. Okay. Now this virtual machine, this D8 SV3, has eight core, 32 gigs of memory. The key piece here to this example is that there's 12,800 uncached IOPS for this machine. Underlying disks are three E30 disks. Now they're using the standard solid state disk that I told you not to use in the previous slide. There's one E30 OS disk that's used for the OS, that supports 500 IOPS and up to 60 megabytes of throughput. In these examples, we're going to be using IOPS as, as our capping example, but be aware that throughput can also be capped. Okay, so here's the process. This application is asking for 10,000 IOPS. Okay, this is fine because that D8V3 can handle up to 12,800 IOPS, but our challenge is not going to be at the machine level. The challenge is going to be at the disk level. We're asking for 1,000 from, uh, from the OS. We're asking for 4,500 from each data disk. But these disks are capped at 500 IOPS. And together, they're only going to give back 1,500 to the application. This is a pretty significant um, capping that's occurring here, and it's happening at the disk level. So how would we fix this? Well, we're going to recommend, remember what I said earlier, we recommend P30s. So if we upgrade to P30s, let's see what happens. OK, so the application again is asking for 10,000 IOPS. OK, and we've already upgraded our disks. So in this case, the 1,000 IOPS goes to the OS, 4,500 to each data disk. And because we've upgraded the disks, we are no longer capped at that level, and the application gets the 10,000 IOPS back that it requested. This is great. So no throttling is occurring at the disk level at this time. Now let's take a look at the VM, though, right? Now, again, we're using the same D8S V3. And remember, there's 12,800 uncached IOPS for this machine. We still have the same P30 disk underneath. There's one OS disk for the operating system, and again, those two data disks. So what happens in this case? Well, this case, we're bumping this up, and we're asking for 15,000 IOPS 
to this D8S V3. Okay, now we're going to send 5,000 IOPS, let's just say, to the OS disk and the two data disk. But we are going to be capped because remember, the uncached disk throughput for the IOPS for this VM is 12,800. So it's not nearly as significant as before, but we are still being capped at least to some degree. All the examples that we've been looking at, we've been considering the attached disk IO and throughput in relation to the limits of the machine and the disk, but there's two limits, okay? There's the max uncached disk throughput. This is the default storage maximum limit that the virtual machine can handle. And the max cache storage throughput limit, this is a separate limit that only applies when you enable host caching. So what is circled here on this slide? If you do not enable host caching, you don't get any of the capabilities that's in this column for any of the VMs that this applies to. And we definitely want to enable host caching. Host caching works by bringing storage closer to the VM so it can be written to or read from very, very quickly. Now, how do we set this up? I've said that it only applies if it's configured. All right, so this is how we enable host caching. You can adjust the host caching to match your workload requirements for each disk. This is how you're going to set it up. You're either going to have none, meaning there's no caching that's going to be used at all. And this is the default when you add a new data disk. It means you actually have to go and do something to enable this. You can set it to read only for workloads that do read only operations. Now, this is going to be like your data disk in TempDB if you can't fit TempDB on the D drive. And then the other option is read write. I'm telling you this because you're going to see it in the drop down read write for workloads that do a balance of read and write operations. This is the default for the OS disk. We do not recommend changing this default, but we do recommend that you only use read only for SQL Server data files and TempDB. Recommend that you use no caching at all for the log file. The log file would not benefit from read caching. Never use uh, the read write caching for SQL Server files as it could result in corruption. So how does caching work? So we're going to run through a couple of examples of, of the different host caching settings to see how it affects the data flow and performance. In the first example, we're looking at what happens with IO requests when host caching is set to read only. So the disk presented in, in the cases that we've been talking about, we want to have enabled the host caching to read only. When a read is performed and the desired data is available on the cache, the cache will return that data, okay? Now, there is no need to read from the physical disk. So this read is counted only towards the VM's cache limits. Now, how about read-only caching if the data is not available in cache? And this should look really familiar. Okay, so I do a read request. It's not in cache, so I have to go to the disk. I, I do a physical read to bring it into cache, which then can be read from cache to the VM. In this case, the read is counted towards both the VM uncached limit and the VM's cached limit. All right, what about writes? When a write is performed, the write has to be written to both the cache and the disk before it is considered complete. The write is counted towards the VM's uncached limit and the VM's cache limit. It's a very high level of how caching works. Okay, remember those 15,000 IOPS? So again, we have this D8S V3. Virtual machine with read-only caching in this case is enabled for these data disks. And notice that the OS disk is read-write, the two data disks are read-only. Again, the app is asking for that 15,000 IOPS. They're broken down to 5,000 5, IOPS for each disk, the OS and the two data disks. Now, because caching is enabled from the underlying storage, we can get the 15,000 IOPS from the cache throughput 
and we do not run into the uncached limit of the virtual machine. So with caching enabled, even at 15,000 IOPS, there's no performance capping occurring. We are not running into this 12,800 IOP limit because we are getting it from this bucket. Okay, again, no VM or disk capping. Now, we are really, really getting close to the sun though. <laughs> so, right, we're pushing towards the edges here. Let's say that instead of 15,000, this app starts asking for 20,000 IOPS. A virtual machine's cache limit are separate from its uncached limit. This means that you can enable host caching on the disk attached to a VM while not enabling host caching on the other disks. This allows your virtual machine to get a combined total storage IO of the cache limit plus the uncached limit. Okay, so again, for this D8S V3, the virtual machine with the limits we've discussed, this time the application is asking for a lot more, right? So what, what do we have here? The OS disk again is 5,000, it's read-write. They're two data disks, they're both read-only, and this time we've added two more disks, right? Now, with these two disks added, we can get a combined cache and uncached to surpass the scenario that we've had before, but this is only gonna work if you can make full use of the cache. So we are combining the 12,800 uncached disk throughput or uncached disk IOPS and the cached disk IOPS to give us 28,600 IOPS which is gonna result in no VM or disk capping. Now, this is gonna be pretty unusual for you to be able to take this much advantage of this situation. Remember, this is only if you can make full use of the cache. The important thing is here is that you can, through heavy amounts of monitoring and careful um, disk and caching selection, get quite a bit even out of a machine the size of a D8 SV3. Let's talk about expanding the IOPS and throughput using storage pools. We've talked talk a little bit about storage spaces lightly. Um, in Windows, you can use storage spaces to stripe disks together. When a VM is attached with several premium storage persistent disks, the disk can be striped together to aggregate the IOPS bandwidth and storage capacity. Basically, storage spaces can be used to group disks together into pools to give us a much higher amount of throughput than what would be available from a single disk and to increase the storage capacity. When we group disks together in pools, these are a collection of disks that get assigned together. If you're using disk striping in a single storage pool, most workloads are gonna benefit from the read caching as we discussed. If you have a separate storage pool for the log and the data files, you're gonna enable read caching only on the storage pool for the data files. Now, you can look at the animation here and you can tell that we're heavily focusing on the column count. This column count is a big determiner for performance. Storage spaces writes data across multiple disks in chunks called stripes. The number of disks in a stripe is called the column count. The number of IOPS in a stripe dictates the IOPS of the volume. This is important. Otherwise, the performance of the stripe volume will be much lower than expected. The reason for the reduced performance is uneven distribution across the disks. In Windows Server, in the Server Manager UI, you can set the number of columns up to eight for a stripe volume. If you need to go higher than that, you're going to need to use PowerShell to set the column count in your PowerShell statement. Now, that being said, be careful, as this is a balance. If you ever want to add more disks, you have to add a multiplier of the current column count. All right, now you can also make this a whole lot easier for yourself. 
there's a number of things here. And Pam, we were talking about the advantages that you can get using the marketplace to help you set up your storage configuration. What what am I getting here that is going to make things a lot easier for me? Sure. Yeah. So this um, so this is an image of the um, portal experience you would get if you were deploying a SQL Server marketplace image. Um, so this is comes to you as part of the SQL IaaS extension that I was talking about earlier. And the nice thing about this is everything that David talked about with the storage pools and storage spaces, all of that configuration can be done for you by this wizard. So all you would need to do here is say how many disks you want in the pool, and then we will automatically um, create the storage pool for you with the correct column count so that you have the, the proper striping across and you get the max IOPS and throughput of the combined disks. And we also, um, you notice here, we have data and log and tempdb as separate. So for data and log, we will go ahead and do the cache settings for you. So we will enable read-only caching on the data drives, and we will not enable any caching on the log storage. And then for tempdb, <clears throat> we'll move that to the local D drive as, um, as we recommended earlier, um, so that your um, IO that goes against the tempdb will not go against your uncached limits. So that will be just local SSD. And it's a very fast SSD that's attached to the VM. So that's great for tempdb performance. And you can leverage that because um, that drive is ephemeral, which means if the VM restarts, that drive goes away, but it's tempdb. So if your VM restarts, SQL Server is going to restart and tempdb is going to go away anyway. So it's a great um, way to leverage that temp storage and to help bring down your uncached IOPS. Um, and so the other thing you might note here is that there's a little warning at the bottom that we've highlighted in a red box. And what that is telling you is similar to what David just talked about with the capping. What we're saying is, hey, you attached three uh, data drives with a total of 15,000 IOPS, but the VM only supports 12,800 IOPS. Um, so we're warning you right here that you could be capped if you actually try to, um, you know, uh, give more IOPS according to the disks that you that you attached. So now we, as we talked about, if you can leverage that read-only caching, then you may not have to worry about that capping because um, that's only talking about the uncached uh, throughput limit of the VM. Um, but it's worth noting that, you know, we, we want to call your attention to that in case you weren't aware that there's two separate capping limits, the disk level capping and the VM level capping. So that's just one way that the IaaS extension helps guide you towards best practices. And it saves you a ton of time in having to configure this manually um, once the machine is online. Perfect. Thank you. So let's talk about like in summary here. We want to collect, I mean, we've got the memory and CPU. These are known variables. You know, what often we don't know is the peak IOPS and the throughput requirements for your data log and tempdb. So recommend getting those. Perfline is a great way of doing that to grab that information. Choose a VM size that can scale to the total IOPS requirements that you're gathering. Look at your cache IO limits. Look at your uncache IO limits. Use that as a combination in your VM size selection with strong memory to core counts based on those scenarios that we talked before. And that's gonna be a really strong option for you. Remember hosting, if you can, it's really gonna come down to size, but if you can try to get um, tempdb isolated on that D, D drive and then uh, take advantage of that Azure blob cache. I was talking about this in terms of uh, host caching. It's, it's the same thing, leverage that Azure blob cache um, especially for read only for your data files. Um, and provision your ultra SSD disk only for the log file. All right, Azure Migrate. So it's a great, great uh, tool to help you, one, assess whether um, your on-prem SQL databases and machines are suitable for the cloud. Get size recommendations for your SQL VMs based on the performance history of your on-premises workload. Get estimate estimate for costs for running uh, on-prem workloads in the cloud, and then be able to look at any of the dependencies and scenarios that you can you have so you can group together some machines 
that you can take advantage of. And Pam, is there any other scenarios here that we want to cover around Azure Migrate? Yeah, so um, my my main um, point with Azure Migrate is that it helps you do that um, sizing analysis that we were talking about. So this can automatically um, guide you towards choosing the correct VM size and the correct storage configuration based on your on-prem metrics. So you can um, you can use this tool to collect performance monitor counters on your existing on-prem workload. And then it can do some analysis and then recommend to you the appropriate VM size as well as the appropriate storage. So this is a great way to guide you through the process that we just talked about. I realize that a lot of this is confusing. There's a lot of different uh, bells and whistles on these VMs and there's a lot of different things for you to look at. So this can help uh, guide you through that process. So really quick performance checklist, um, ensure you have the right VM size to avoid disk capping scenarios. I think we walked through that pretty well. Um, keep your storage account in, v in, the, in your SQL Server uh, virtual machine in the same region to avoid uh, uh, cross-network chatter. Move all of your data files to premium storage with read-only caching. Use storage pools with disk striping to achieve data IOPS requirements for your workloads. Put TempDB on the local SSD drive, if you can, the D drive. Provision your Ultra SSD uh, for the log file only. In that case, there's no caching or pools that you need to, need to configure. For the M series, look for write acceleration if your Ultra SSD is not available. So it kind of gives you some options there for that really low latency scenario. On the SQL Server side, enable database page compression, enable instant file initialization for your data files, limit auto growth of the database, enable lock pages in memory, and for SQL Server 2019, enable accelerated database recovery. All right, so right now we're gonna hand it back to Pam so we can talk about high availability and disaster recovery options. Thanks, Dave. So the last topic we're going to cover today is high availability and disaster recovery options for Azure VMs. So the good news is, of course, it's SQL Server in Azure just the same as it's SQL Server on-prem. So the high availability and disaster recovery options you have for SQL Server in Azure VM are pretty much the same as what you have on-prem. Um, so this should be very familiar to you. The main technologies are failover clustered instances, always on availability groups, log shipping, um, of course, backup and restore. Um, although when you're in Azure, um, leveraging Azure Blob Storage Service for backups directly to Blob Storage is usually the best way to go. So that's um, a little bit different than how you might be doing them on-prem. And then for older versions of SQL, we do have database mirroring. However, um, that has been deprecated for quite some time. Um, so probably most of you are looking at failover clustered instances or availability groups for your HADR needs in Azure VM. Now, some of these options are also good, not only for HADR when you get to Azure, but for migration into Azure. So of always on availability groups is one way that you can have um, an availability group on-prem, and then you can set up a second availability group in Azure and do a distributed availability group between them. And then that would allow you to be running both on-prem and in Azure during that cutover period where you're preparing for the migration. So that's one um, really easy migration strategy if you're on those newer versions of SQL Server that allow for distributed availability groups. If you're on an older version of SQL Server, or if maybe you don't need to keep things up to date as frequently as um, with availability groups, you can leverage log shipping. So log shipping is essentially just a backup, copy, backup, and restore. So um, very simple to do um, hybrid across on-prem and into Azure. And again, another uh, great solution for lift and shift. And then, of course, you've got your backup. You can backup into um, Azure Blob Storage from on-prem, uh, 
obviously you have to have the right networking set up and, and the performance could be a little bit slower than if you're writing directly to local storage. Um, but that's another way to get a backup up into Azure and to um, start your migration from on-prem into Azure. Okay, so of course there are a few things that are unique to Azure. So one thing that you have to consider is um, a redundancy option for your cluster. So when you're on-prem, you're managing all of your own hardware. So you're taking care of setting up redundancy in the hardware. You're also taking care of things like cluster aware um, patching and um, you know, making sure that you have redundancy in the hardware so that you can maintain hardware if it needs to be maintained and things like that. Since uh, Microsoft is managing that for you in Azure, you don't necessarily know when we may be doing scheduled maintenance, say on the host machine, we, we need to patch the host machine where your VM is running, or we need to do some maintenance on the hardware that it's all sitting on. Um, so what we offer um, to, um, to ensure your VMs are available during that scheduled maintenance is um, availability sets and availability zones. So availability sets would be um, within a single Azure data center. And what you would do for availability sets is the two VMs that you have or two or more VMs that you have in your solution, um, say failover cluster or availability group, you would put them in the same availability set, but in different fault domains and different update domains. And so the different fault domains means they're in the same data center, but, but they're in, say, a different rack so that they don't share the same backplane and therefore, um, you know, they have better resiliency um, in, the, in the separated hardware. And then for update domains, um, in this case, if we need to take a host down to do some maintenance on that host, for example, we guarantee that we're not going to take down both VMs at the same time if they're in different update domains. So availability sets guarantees that one of the two VMs, at least one of the two VMs will be up 99.95% of the time. So you would have both VMs in the cluster in the same availability set, but different fault domains and different update domains. Now for availability zones, here you get a little bit more resiliency because we're going across data centers. So with availability zones, we have different data centers in the same Azure region. And so each one of these would be a different zone. And the way you would use availability zones would be the different nodes of your cluster would be in different availability zones. Um, and so with this situation, again, you can guarantee that one of those VMs is up, in this case, 99.99% of the time because they are com in completely separate data centers, even though they're within the same region. So with availability zones, you get that extra uh, resiliency and that extra uptime, but the trade-off here is potentially performance. If you're doing something like a synchronous availability group, the distance between the, the nodes, since they're not in the same data center, um, that can cause some latency in the solution and could potentially cause um, some performance issues on, um, on the primary. Um, so these are your options for infrastructure level redundancy in Azure. That's an Azure only solution that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with SQL Server. So SQL Server is not going to be aware of availability sets or availability zones. That's just to guarantee that the VMs are online. On top of that, you would then leverage one of the SQL Server solutions to provide high availability for the SQL Server service itself. So as I mentioned before, you're probably going to be going with either failover cluster or an availability group. So for failover clusters, in order for that to work, you have to have some type of shared storage. When you're on-prem, that shared storage is typically a SAN that's directly attached to all the nodes of the cluster. Again, in Azure, you don't have control over the hardware. So you have to have some sort of an Azure service to provide that shared storage for you. So one of the options for shared storage in a failover cluster in Azure VM is premium file share. Um, so this would be where you would host your SQL Server data files on SMB storage on these file shares. This is a fully managed file uh, storage solution for you. It provides zonal redundancy, so you can use those availability zones, 
it's relatively easy to manage all, because the file shares themselves are all managed by Azure. You don't have to do a lot of work. Everything is handled for you. You just configure this up front, attach it to your cluster, and put your SQL Server data files on it. So the pros of this is it's easy to manage and it provides zonal redundancy. You've got burstable performance and um, file storage up to 100 terabytes. The cons here is um, no caching and uh, that that's that host caching we talked about earlier and lower IOPS and size ratio compared to managed disks. So with this, you're not gonna get the same level of performance that you might get with some of the other solutions. So this is great for resiliency but not as good for performance. Uh, second option is Storage Spaces Direct or S2D. So Storage Spaces Direct is actually a Windows technology. It's not unique to Azure. Some of you may actually be using Storage Spaces Direct on-prem um, because this is another uh, solution for, for providing shared storage in a cluster environment. Um, but in Azure, it's great because again, you don't have the option of just directly attaching a SAN to both nodes. Um, so Storage Spaces Direct is great because this has um, its own caching mechanism um, and you can have the ability to scale much higher for IOPS and throughput. You should be able to get to the VM maximum where you might not be able to get there with premium file shares. Cons here are that Storage Spaces Direct is only supported on Windows Server 2016 and later. So if you're on older versions of Windows, uh, this may not be an option for you. And also there's a relatively high uh, bar for maintenance here. You have to configure the storage spaces cluster yourself, and then you would have to manage it uh, going forward because this is all within the VM. This is not something that Azure is going to manage for you. So there's quite a bit of additional manageability that comes with this. However, you do get uh, good resiliency and good performance with this solution. And the last solution, which is a relatively new feature in Azure, is Azure Shared Disk. So Azure Shared Disk is um, the same disks that we've already talked to you about, the premium or ultra SSD, but in this case, they're shared, which means you can have a single disk attached to multiple nodes of your cluster. And so this, this uh, essentially works the same as having a shared disk on-prem, where you have one disk that's attached to both machines. Um, and so this is probably the, the, the easiest way to, to do a lift and shift migration of an on-prem cluster up into Azure. Cool thing about Azure Shared Disk, super easy to configure. You're just, you just attach a premium disk to both uh, VMs um, or an ultra disk to both VMs. It works on both Windows Server and SQL Server 2008 and higher. So this will work for your older versions of SQL Server. Um, and it's all um, built into to Windows Server failover clustering. So it's going to work very similar to what you're used to on-prem. And um, this can give you, again, good performance, but a lot easier manageability than um, Storage Spaces Direct. Okay, so let's tie all this together. So we talked about our failover cluster options and the different shared disks. So, and we also talked about availability sets and availability zones. So you've got some options here that offer you different levels of performance, availability, and manageability. So first we'll talk about the availability set. So you've got two VMs in the same availability set, different fault domains, different update domains. With this, you can do an always-on availability group with synchronous replication, or you can do SQL Server failover clustered instance with S2D or premium file share. This solution offers you 99.95% um, availability. So this is a good balance of performance and availability if you're using S2D. For uh, premium file shares, good availability, slightly less performance. So uh, the, the premium file shares, easier to manage. Storage spaces direct comes with some management overhead. So the next option is um, great for manageability, good performance, but not as high availability today. This may change in the future. So this is your Azure shared disk. On Ultra SSD, we would re recommend for performance. You can do this on premium SSD as well. However, the premium SSD does not support caching when it's in a shared configuration. So you might probably want to opt for uh, Ultra SSD in this case. So right now, Azure shared disk is not um, zonal. So it does not support zone availability. So with this, 
you have to be in a single zone. So you lose a little bit of um, resiliency because of that. You go down to 99.9% .9 availability. However, it is a very easy to manage solution. And as we said, good for lift and shift and decent performance. So this is definitely a good option for you um, if the 99.9% .9 availability is um, works for you. Also remember, um, this will be changing in the future. We hope they will be supporting more availability options. So hopefully that uh, resiliency will, will um, increase in the future. Um, and then the last one is to optimize for resiliency. This is your multiple availability zones. So with uh, availability zones, one VM in one zone, another VM in another zone, you can do always on availability groups with synchronous replication. Again, there could be a little bit more latency here because the um, uh, the virtual machines will not be as close together as they would be if they were in the same availability set. Um, but but um, you that is usually manageable for mo most workloads. Um, and then you also have the option of SQL Server failover clustered instance with premium file share. Okay, so that's maximum resiliency, but you suffer a little bit on performance with this solution as a trade-off. So these are your options for combining the Azure redundancy options for your virtual machines with SQL Server high availability options. So as you can imagine, things can be a little bit more complicated to configure uh, when you're in Azure. Um, one of the things you notice is this is an example of availability groups configuration in Azure VMs. And you might see something here that you haven't seen before, and that's this Azure load balancer. So when you're running a cluster or an availability group in Azure, you don't have the option to use a virtual network name, uh, either for the listener or for the failover clustered instance, like you would if you were on-prem. So the Azure load balancer is required to do that name resolution to the appropriate replica. Um, so we have some automated ways that you can configure this. You can do this with Azure CLI. We also have some quick start templates. But the latest addition to this is a new Azure portal experience that walks you through creating an availability group, including the creation of the load balancer. So that's a great way, if you're not sure how to get this done in Azure, that's a great way to walk you through that easy wizard-like portal experience that will um, take you from two VMs to availability group with load balancers and everything. You can also do this manually. We have all of this fully documented, but the portal experience is probably the easiest way to go for configuring availability groups um, in Azure VM. And then um, last thing we wanna talk about with high availability is another new feature that we've just introduced in SQL Server, and that is distributed network name support or DNN support. So as I mentioned, if you're running a failover cluster or an availability group in Azure, you need to have this Azure load balancer. With distributed network names, however, you do not need the load balancer. You can use DNNs um, very similar to how you would use virtual network names on-prem, and then that allows you to run either a failover cluster or an availability group without the load balancer. So DNN support is actually a feature of the SQL Server box product itself. So you would need SQL Server 2019 CU2 in order to do um, failover clusters with distributed network names. Um, and you would need SQL Server 2019 CU8 to do availability groups with distributed network names. So um, with those newer versions of SQL Server, you can get very close to your on-prem um, cluster and AG experience using DNNs, and then even more using Azure Shared Disk on top of that closest you get to lift and shift of, of your on-prem environment into Azure VMs. So great options for high availability and disaster recovery in Azure VM, your choice of how much availability you need and how much manageability that, that you want to have Azure do for you. So with that, um, that takes us to the end of our uh, session today. Thank you very much for attending and um, we, David and I will be sticking around for some Q&A for the next 15 minutes. So please feel free to stick around. We'll answer as many questions as we can. And then um, if you have additional questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. Thanks very much, everyone. That was great, Pran. Thank you very much. And we'll be around for Q&A.